Hello everyone. So today we are going to discuss some of the main themes related to Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. This is the second science fiction novel that we are discussing after uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's novel The Word for World is Forest. So some of the themes are similar, some of the themes are different. So we will discuss some of these uh, similarities and differences as we go into the video. So speaking about Margaret Atwood, first of all, uh, I don't think we need much of an introduction to her. She is one of the most famous writers who are uh, alive today. And uh, uh, she is one of the very few people who have been awarded multiple Booker Prizes uh, for her works. And uh, what is uh, notable about her is that unlike Ursula K. Le Guin, who is primarily famous as a science fiction writer, Atwood is definitely a part of the mainstream literary, uh, you know, literary world, right? And uh, her works have been uh, very popular around the world, especially uh, her 1985 novel, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, recently, it has been made into a TV series, which you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, the sequel to that novel, which was published uh, uh, two years ago, in 2019, uh, was responsible for winning her the second Booker, Fri Booker Prize. Her first Booker Prize uh, was received for The Blind Assassin, uh, which was published in 2000. And in 2019, she got the second uh, Booker Prize for The Testaments, which is the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. So some of you at least might have uh, read The Handmaid's Tale or maybe you have read some of her poems in other courses. She's a poet as well. So you might uh, know some of her preoccupations, some of the main ideas that she is concerned about. Uh, one of the principal ideas is feminism uh, or you know uh, a women-centric point of view. Uh, this is especially true in uh, true about her novel, The Handmaid's Tale, which is about, uh, again, it is about a post-apocalyptic or a dystopian world in which, uh, you know, a sort of a religious uh, fundamentalism has taken over the entire world and under this uh, sort of a uh, dictatorship, women are treated as, uh, you know, nothing but, uh, you know, instruments for procreation. They are just treated as people who who need to give birth to the next generation, and uh, so that is an interesting uh, story. Uh, but our particular story is in a different kind of a dystopia. It is um, it is a scientific world in which uh, one particular science, the the science of genetic engineering, has become extremely advanced, and uh, Edward is sort of exploring the the consequences of that in this particular novel. Okay. So, um, yeah, so these are some of her major works, The Hand Handmaid's Tale in 1985. Uh, then, like I mentioned, The Blind Assassin earned her her first Booker Prize in 2000. This particular novel is part of a trilogy of novels uh, called the Mad Adam Trilogy. There are three novels in this uh, series. So this story does not end uh, here. It is carried on in two more novels. But our discussion is mainly uh, limited to the first uh, novel. Okay, so uh, returning to Atwood's main uh, literary concerns once again. Like I mentioned, see, she belongs to the mainstream literary fiction, but um, the kind of fiction that she writes is often termed speculative fiction because it is based on some sort of uh, an imaginative, um, you know, imaginative idea about what the world might be like. Right? So in this world uh, that she is writing in Oryx and Craig, she's taking the existing science of genetic engineering and she is imagining a world in which the full potential of that is, uh, you know, that is uh, unleashed upon the world. Okay. 
but uh, atwood herself does not like the word science fiction uh, although she has been called a science fiction writer by mainstream uh, critics uh, and uh, you know she has even won some of the most prestigious awards in science fiction including the nebula prize uh, you know and the hugo awards uh, she herself does not want to categorize herself as a science fiction writer and that is mainly because she thinks that science fiction is too limiting uh, a genre and she prefers the term uh, speculative fiction instead so whatever it is uh, you know we can you know there's no nothing wrong in us identifying her works as science fiction so coming back to some of her main thematic uh, concerns uh, in most of her novels we see a dystopia now dystopia is a term that you might already be familiar with it describes a world in which something has drastically gone wrong it is the philosophical opposite of what we call a utopia whereas a utopia is like an ideal world in which everything is perfect a dystopia is a world in which things have really gone wrong in some way okay so uh, the world that she talks about is a sort of a near future world it is almost similar to our world but it is in the future so um, the main problem with this world is actually you know it's not just a single problem there are many problems but the main problem is uh, that capitalism has really uh, taken root in this world and it has started to uh, you know it has started to influence all kinds of aspects of life not just trade and commerce not just the economy it has even started to influence culture uh, it has taken over how people uh, you know uh, experience living itself life itself is being shaped by capitalism in this world okay. and by capitalism uh, we mean a world in which corporations have really become the most powerful entities you know, more than nations more than countries uh this is a world in which uh multinational corporations are the greatest sources of political and social power okay uh so that is why this is a dystopia now the second aspect of this problem is science okay so although we consider science to be a positive force a uh, 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 you know a progressive influence in our life in oryx and greek science has uh, you know lost all its ethical dimensions it is no longer limited by any sort of ethical concerns and we have this uh, you know unrestricted use of genetic engineering so you have the use of science to create hybrid animals uh, you know mix mixture of two or more animals together taking certain characteristics from one animal and giving it to another uh, you know uh, we'll see some of these examples later on so uh, there is no scruples you know there is no uh, morals which are associated with science anymore okay so that is another aspect of this dystopia and then you have um, you know the, the key event of this novel which is um, an apocalypse right so uh, the main uh, reason of this apocalypse is uh, the release of a deadly virus now this virus uh, you know it's it, you no know, this novel was written in 2003 you know much much before corona virus but here atwood is talking about the same kind of a global pandemic right a very powerful a very uh, dangerous virus is released into the world and uh, you know it brings on sudden death immediate death right and almost all human beings are killed and very few people survive and these people who survive they have to figure out how to live in this post apocalyptic world a world where human civilization has failed or it has it has been completely wiped out in some way and now they have to figure out how this uh, new existence is going to be uh, realized so in a sense uh, this work can be called a post modern work because it is against uh, the main principles of modernity right you know you have already 
studied a lot of aspects of modernism, modernity in, uh, you know, literary criticism papers, cultural studies papers, etc. So you can use some of those ideas to analyze this novel as well, because the key idea behind modernity is progress, right? As moderns, we believe that, you know, uh, we are capable of advancing to the next step. And we believe that the next step, uh, you know, we advance to will always be better than the previous step. Okay. So modernity is, um, you know, dependent on this idea of progress. Right? And science has been the greatest, uh, what do you say, uh, engine of modernity. Right. It is like this uh, engine which is propelling us forward into a better world every time. Right. Without any sort of, uh, you know, uh, problems or without any sort of slowing down. It is constantly propelling us into this better future. But here we have a post-apocalyptic world in which science itself is responsible for the destruction of the world. It is responsible for uh, the, the complete annihilation of the human race. And therefore it becomes a sort of an anti-modern narrative or a post-modern narrative. Right? It tells us about the excess of science, right? What, uh, you know, what science has, uh, you know, um, sort of exceeded its grasp in achieving, trying to achieve. Okay. So one more thing uh, I want to mention uh, from this slide about Atwood is, you know, she is one of the most um, inventive users of language, right? Um, especially in the in the kind of innovative terms that she invents if you just go through this work very quickly you'll find a lot of new words that are being you know created by atwood to describe you know new animals uh, new kinds of technologies new kinds of corporations that are you know made uh, so there is a great uh, you know there is a great innovation in the way that she uses language right uh, so that is well, probably one of the things that uh, really sets her apart from any other writer because um, in most other science fiction no uh, stories you know the the main attraction is uh, uh, you know the scientific principles or it is just the strangeness of the world that it creates but uh, in atwood's world worlds more than feeling strange we recognize that world. You know, we understand that this is very, very close to our world itself. But, you know, this is a, a dystopian world. You know, this is telling us about how the world has gone wrong in certain ways. So that is something which is very uh, unique about her works because she is not trying to create a completely alien world or a different world. She is trying to show us the possible ways in which our own world might evolve. Okay, okay so let's uh, spend a little bit uh, of time looking at the world of Oryx and Craig. So as I mentioned, this is a near-future capitalist dy dystopia. So you can imagine that this story is taking place maybe uh, 50 or 60 or even just 100 years from this present moment. So this is a world in which there are no countries as such, right? Instead of countries, you have corporations. And these corporations own uh, great amounts of land. And uh, basically, these, this land has been turned into a sort of a castle, right? They have enclosed this land into a compound, what they call a compound. And all the people who are working for the corporation they are given uh, you know a place inside the compound uh, they live there they work there uh, life is very comfortable it is very luxurious inside the compounds but outside these walled compounds you know it is complete anarchy right there is nothing there is no rule of law uh, there are people uh, who engage in all kinds of criminal activities and basically it is uh, you know it is like uh, outlaws right uh, the 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 place which is outside of law right uh, so there's a great contrast between life inside the compounds and life outside the compounds right inside is uh, you know more what do you say uh, uh, 
all aspects of life are controlled by these corporations uh, because they make all the products and uh, life inside the compounds is somewhat artificial right it is always uh, sort of you know it, it is serving the corporate purpose while you are living inside the compound you have to become a part of that you know gigantic corporate machine and you have to contribute to it uh, but outside you know the the story is different you have real people you have real life but uh, there is no uh, you know there is no prosperity uh, people die of diseases they are not able to afford uh, proper treatments right so even though life is supposedly free outside the compounds you have more freedom but at the same time it is a sort of a, a you know nasty brutal kind of life that you have outside okay now these compounds themselves they have a uh, security uh, uh, you know they have people who keep the people inside the compound safe but they are also like jailers you know they they prevent people from inside the compounds going out into the plebe lands right yeah so the the place outside the compounds are called plebe lands because uh, it is derived from the word plebeian right plebeians are common citizens they are ordinary people but the people inside the compounds they are special they are extraordinary you know? in some cases they are even genetically altered you know they are modified humans who live inside the compounds okay so yeah coming to the next point uh, it is about science now the compounds are able to become so powerful because of their dependence on many kinds of science okay so this entire future world is uh, characterized by extreme scientific dependence you know people depend on scientific inventions um they have so many innovative technologies you know and mostly these technologies are based on genetic engineering but uh, while in our own world you know science is still regarded as an intellectual activity right it is done for the sake of understanding the world right but in atwood's world science is just a, a way of uh, generating new intellectual properties right new ways to commercialize things new new ways to make more money uh, and uh, you know bring out more products etc so the focus of science is different right it is no longer a quest for knowledge it is rather a quest for power uh, uh, you know economic wealth etc okay. so yeah the dominant science in this world is of course uh, genetic engineering let's see a little bit more about that so this world is extremely advanced as far as uh, genetic engineering is concerned especially you know you have a lot of hybrid animals right for example uh, you know you have uh, pigoons you know pigoons are like modified genetically modified pigs and they are created so that uh, you know they can actually produce human organs inside their body so this pig can actually supply you with a human liver or a human kidney or even a human heart right so you know if you are you know if the human organ is failing you don't need to get a donor uh, you know donor organ from an actual human being you can grow an artificial uh, heart or a liver inside a pig and you can transplant it into your own body but the problem with this pigoons is that not only are they uh, producing human hearts and human livers they are even producing human uh, brain tissue right neurons so part of their brain is actually human nerve cells so what happens later in the story is that these pigoons they they develop consciousness right sort of a human consciousness and later on in the story they even develop a sort of a what do you call it a telepathy right they are able to communicate with other pigs and even with humans so you have this great you know ethical dilemma are these animals or are these you know are these uh, humans right so 
uh, you can even read some of these issues in connection with uh, you know the uh, uh, novel by Kurtzi, right? Um, the lives of animals, because a lot of uh, ideas in this story has to do with animals or hybrid animals. For example, the second uh, animal which is listed here is Rakang. Rakang is a splice. It is a hybrid animal made of a raccoon and a skunk. Okay, so um, um, it's 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 kept as a pet, right? One of the main characters in the story, uh, the narrator of the story, keeps this animal as a pet when he is a child. And one of the traumatic incidents in his life is when this animal is freed from him, right? His mother is like an activist and she uh, frees his pet animal and then she runs away from home. Okay. So uh, the name of this pet was Killer, right? And, um, you know, we can interpret this incident as the release of Killer. And uh, this character, the main character in the story, uh, he has a lot to do with the apocalypse that later happens in the story. He's responsible for killing a lot of uh, innocent human beings. So with the release of killer, uh, the you know the killer instincts of the people are also released, and that's one possible interpretation of that. Okay, uh, other. You know, uh, hybrid animals are there like Lyobams, which is like a, a lion plus lamb uh, splice. Uh, chicky knobs. Chicky knobs are like, you know, um, chicken tissue, which is, you know, grown in a factory. Instead of growing chickens in a farm, you can grow chicken legs in a factory and uh, you can just directly consume them. So, you know, these kind of modified organisms, they are commercialized and they are mass produced, right? And these companies, they are constantly trying to uh, compete with each other and sometimes they even sabotage the other, uh, you know, the other rivals in the market. And there are even wars that are fought over commodities like coffee. Okay. So as a background to all of these, there is widespread environmental damage. Uh, the, uh, the earth is completely taken over by these commercial activities. Uh, rainforests have been cut down. Animals are going extinct. In fact, extinction is a major theme in this story. Right? Uh, when we see the main characters, uh, the main characters play a game called Extinct, Aton, extinct the Thought. Just like Marathon, you know, this is a game where uh, the players try to remember the, the, the properties of extinct animals. You know, so you, uh, you ask the other person to guess what animal you are describing, right? You describe an, an extinct animal and the other player has to correctly guess which extinct animal it is. So this game is very difficult because there are millions of extinct animals, right? And more and more animals are going extinct every day. So, you know, that is extinction. Extinction is a major theme. Another major uh, force in this novel is the contrast between virtual existence and real existence. Right? So, as I mentioned, inside the compounds, the characters lead a very sheltered life. So, they don't really experience reality. They live in a sort of a simulacrum, right? They live in a simulated kind of an existence. And, uh, you know, media has a great impact on their life. And most of the content on this media is um, composed of, I mean, comprised of violence and sex. So these even young children, you know, they grow up, uh, you know, consuming media and they become... Uh, you know, shaped by what they consume, right? So most of the violence which happens in this novel, the killing of the entire human race, uh, that is actually a consequence of the violence that is propagated through media and, uh, you know, through games, virtual reality games, etc. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that is one aspect of it. 
and supplementing that aspect of you know dangerous violence uh, etc is um widespread exploitation of human beings this is a world in which there is a very vibrant uh, you know very powerful racket for sex trafficking and human trafficking one of the major uh, female characters in this story horix uh, she uh, she is of south asian uh, southeast asian origin probably from indonesia or thailand or vietnam or you know one of these eastern countries and as a child her mother you know sells her you know her mother is forced to sell her to a prostitute uh, into prostitution and she becomes involved in child prop pornography as an actor and uh, later on she comes to america and uh, you know that is when she meets the other two main characters in the story okay. so uh, she is a victim right she is a victim of child abuse and sex sex trafficking and uh, child pornography and it shows uh, you know how morally bankrupt this world has become all of these activities are uh, no longer punished because there is no justice system in this world it is just a few corporations running everything so there is no real uh, punishment for crimes like this okay so all of these things all of these aspects together make this uh, a dystopia which is on the verge of collapse okay. all right so now let us just quickly look at the main characters of the story so first of all you have uh, the narrator of the story who is called snowman uh, but in his earlier life that is before the apocalypse he was uh, known as jimmy right so jimmy is uh, you know he is a person who um, grew up in a very uh, problematic uh, family his father and mother worked for the corporations the compounds inside one of the compounds and uh, um, as he was growing up his mother became more and more um, you know, disillusioned with the compounds she sort of understood that the compounds are really toxic um, they are destroying the world and so her mother decides to sort of uh, run away from all of these and uh, become a sort of a Uh, a terrorist a kind of a bio terrorist right so early on in life jimmy is abandoned by his mother and his father is still working for the corporations but he doesn't have any time to care for him so he he leads a very neglected isolated kind of life right so he he spends most of his time um you know going from one relationship to the other he becomes a sort of like a serial womanizer later on in life uh, and uh, he is interested in literature he is interested in arts he goes to a college called the martha graham academy which is a sort of a institution for humanities in this world and there he studies um rhetoric a kind of rhetoric uh, which is made to Uh, which is designed to fool others into buying products basically it is kind of like advertising right he becomes an advertising expert so that is his background so it is while uh, he is growing up he has only one friend and that is the second character in the story the main character called craig now craig is a pseudonym uh, his actual name is glen and he was also the the son of um uh, you know two scientists who work for the corporations but glen is like this um uh, you know child genius you know right from his early childhood he was extremely intelligent um but sort of you know he was his um childhood was a very sad one because he too faced neglect he was he too was exposed to all these kind of uh corruption and uh, uh toxic influences of media violence etc so he became obsessed with uh this idea you know the idea to somehow improve human beings 
he thought that as a uh, you know as a animal human brain, beings are completely flawed in several ways so using the science of um, genetic engineering uh, craig decides to create a new branch of human brains a new kind of human brain beings who will who will not suffer from any of the problems that human beings have okay. so this is his dream project right he want to create this new brand of human beings called crakers right and uh, crakers uh, they are you know they are beautiful uh, uh, and they have immunity from almost all kinds of diseases but at the same time they lack certain things that human beings have right uh, for example there is no uh no great imaginative capability they are not capable of imagining a lot of things they are not capable of uh, reading and writing uh and most of all the most important difference is that uh, they have a fixed uh lifetime they will live only till 30 35 years old and then suddenly they will die off so there is no disease there is no uh you know Uh, old age nothing like that one fine day they are at the peak of their youth and then they just die and they they are not even capable of understanding death or mortality right so that is what uh, you know craig has created in this artificial group of human beings okay and uh, the final character is oryx whom i mentioned earlier she uh, you know in her early life she was a part of a sex trafficking uh, ring but uh, while jimmy and uh, craig were children or adolescents uh, they saw one of these child pornography videos and from that moment onwards jimmy was obsessed with craig and later when craig came to america uh, jimmy was able to uh, recognize her from this early video and uh, he was the one who introduced her to uh, craig and craig also fell in love with oryx so there is a sort of like a love triangle going on between oryx craig and jimmy but you know craig is always more dominant because he is the one who is a genius he is much more intelligent than jimmy so ultimately you know oryx becomes craig's helper and uh, oryx is the one who actually trains crakers right who tells them about uh, various mythologies uh, you know various ways in which they have to live in the world etc so oryx is like this teacher or this mother figure for the crakers right so crake and oryx together they are like the father and mother of the crakers all right so the uh, the main story which happens in this novel is uh craig decides to develop a very deadly disease uh and uh, he distributes this disease all across the world uh dis- disguised as a sort of a a pleasure pill right he makes this medicine uh, called bliss plus b l y s s p l u s s bliss is a feeling of extreme joy right so anybody who takes this pill feels overcome with joy right they feel so happy they feel completely content and they don't have to suffer any sort of depression or anything like that so using uh, uh craig as a messenger he distributes this drug all across the world he man- mass manufactures it and he distributes uh, it all across the world but along with this drug there is also a virus which is embedded in this and that virus is capable of killing human beings very rapidly okay so one fine day um, people start dying right uh, and death is very swift it comes very quickly and almost all human beings die within a matter of hours okay so um, the rest of the story is uh, narrated from uh, jimmy's perspective after the apocalypse he is you know like uh the the only survival uh, surviving human being not the only one there are other human beings but 
in this novel we don't get to know the others right so in this novel he is the only surviving human being and he has to take care of these crackers so he becomes like this uh, prophet figure who tells them what to do who tells them what is dangerous what is edible you know like that and he calls himself the snowman because uh like the you know you might have heard of the yeti right yeti is also you know it's a mythical creature which is supposed to live in the himalayas another name of the yeti is the abominable snowman okay so the yeti is not a real creature it is a it is what is called uh uh you know uh, uh, a part of cryptozoology that is certain creatures that might or might not be real okay so uh, jimmy thinks of himself as a uh, a figure like this abominable snowman right he is leading a, a life which is sort of like unreal right because all the things that he is familiar with the world um his uh, friends everybody has died and he is like the sole survivor in this uh, post apocalyptic world okay all right so that is uh, the major uh, ideas uh, in the major plot points which are there in this novel so let's just look at the main themes as well so like i said the annihilation of society or extinction or apocalypse is the main theme uh now apocalypse is uh, a deeply religious theme as well right if you look at the bible there is an entire branch of biblical studies called uh, eschatology e s c h a t o l o g y eschatology is the study of um, the apocalypse that is the end times the time when um, you know uh, god destroys the world and then sort of uh, saves people who are uh, virtuous and then punishes those who are uh, sinful okay so christ is supposed to be uh, you know uh, the judge of you know who is who is uh, sinful who is uh, virtuous so in his second coming he will come in the uh, figure of this judge right who will destroy the world and at the same time who will judge people for their actions so the apocalypse which happens in this novel is also like that it's a deeply uh, you know it's a, it's a kind of a judgment of humanity okay. and uh, the greatest crime that humanity has con- uh, uh, committed in this novel is uh, playing god with you know the science of genetic engineering uh, creating these hybrid animals uh, creating a, a sort of a capitalist culture of science and generally uh, you know it results in the exploitation of human beings and nature so atwood is trying to raise awareness about you know the the potential of science not only to create a better world but also to completely utterly destroy it so even um, even emerging disciplines of science you know we are living in a world where right now we have artificial intelligences who are capable of writing complete you know uh, you know college level essays um, you know we are living in a world in which uh, there is a metaverse where people are uh, people don't even have to uh, engage with each other face to face even you know we are using virtual technologies for having this very lecture right so atwood is imagining the future of these technologies right what is going to happen if these technologies are somehow freed from morality and uh, the result is frightening right the result is an apocalypse and therefore this novel becomes a very important text in this particular point of history uh, because you know we have we can connect this novel with uh, you know koitsi's work we can connect it with uh, haraway's uh, you know essay on the anthropocene uh, you know uh, plantation ocean uh, all of that it is a very um, you know it's a very what do you say 
a postmodern kind of a text which is trying to uh, you know critique the ways in which we have been approaching uh, you know these notions of modernity progress scientific uh, utopia etc okay okay so these are some of the main themes i don't want to uh, drag the video out excessively uh, so i hope you have been able to read this novel because uh, i think we assigned this as a uh, you know a reading text right from the beginning of the semester but you know i know that we have a lot of texts in our syllabus some of these texts are you know really long and reading them might be uh, you know sort of like uh, not a very easy task so anyway uh, if you haven't read it uh, go through the plot uh, i think a detailed plot summary is available online uh, so you can uh, go through that uh, you can even uh, look at some of the themes of margaret atwood's other works like handmade tale and the testaments uh, some of them are reflected in this novel as well uh, but if you do decide to read the text it's a very interesting one especially in the use of language you know as i mentioned earlier the way in which uh, atwood invents new terms is really fascinating right uh, so yeah so that is what i want to say about uh, oryx and craig for now so uh, listen to this uh, uh, if you have any particular doubts or questions that you want to uh, ask me if you want me to clarify anything about this text further uh, do let me know uh, Uh, if time permits i will definitely uh, you know make another video or you know i can uh, address it over uh, whatsapp you know i can send you an answer to your questions so uh, all the best for your preparation uh, i'm sure that all of you will do well uh, so yeah so that's it uh, i'll see you in the next uh, semester